Welcome to Hawthorne University's webinar series. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and I'm just delighted to be here together to be able to facilitate this special presentation. And certainly, we'll have time for question and answers afterwards. Um, we'll respond to your questions and comments at the end of the presentation, certainly, but please write them into the webinar question panel at any time so you're in queue. And um, I just want to remind you that the um, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be up for replay on our website in just a few days. So today's focus is neuroscience and mind, healing the vagus nerve. Of course, you know, we're all interested in living more positive and stress-free lives. And yet many of us really struggle with knowing how to harness the potential benefits of stress. Yes, I said the potential benefits of stress. And to be able to mitigate the negative and implement the necessary changes in order to beneficially impact the brain and nervous system's function. So and today, Sally Gray is going to delve into our mindset, which can be one of the key disruptors of vagus nerve function. She's going to explore the role of emotions and feelings on stress, particularly in relation to the hormone cortisol and the neuroscience of neuroplasticity. I'm just so pleased, and we are so fortunate to have Sally Gray presenting from the other side of the world, literally. Sally is a naturopath, nutritionist, an herbalist, a transpersonal practitioner, neuroscience and academy graduate, and self-confessed personal growth junkie with over 20 years <laughs> of clinical experience. I love that, Sally. And Sally hails from Australia and is presenting from the other side of the world for this presentation. Sally, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. It's absolutely my pleasure to be with you. I, um, I'm really honoured to be speaking with you today and to everyone at Hawthorne University. So thank you for having me. Certainly. I'm really eager to hear more about your insights that support us to both understand um, more about the vagus nerve and be able to actually implement the information that you're going to share with us again today. So thank you so much. And I want to um, give the stage to you now and have you um, begin when you're ready. Well, thank you very much, Paula. That's lovely. And I'm really, I'm really um, hoping that by the end of our time here today, that everyone who's listening will walk away with um, some questions to pose themselves, to really find a way to move forward, to empower their own journey. Because I think the way forward to navigate a path around all of the, the prevailing predictions for, for diminishing health is in our hands. I think that we've got within our, our very capacity the, the opportunity to create vibrant health. And I think what we're missing is an understanding of one of the key core pillars that I hope to share some, some information about today, which really is the brain, the mind, the vagus nerve, and how that understanding and some strategies to enhance health in that realm will really make every other aspect of creating health in our lives far more effective. So when we understand how to keep the vagus nerve healthy, to keep our brain and our mind optimally functioning, it will enhance the nutrition impact. It will enhance our exercise. It will enhance every other thing that we do to try and live a stress-free life. So I will dive into this presentation and there are questions at the end so we can chat more about it then. But first of all, let's just talk about what the vagus nerve is and why it's something that you really want to know, know about. And uh, it's, it's considered to be the, the primary mind-body connector, the most important nerve in the body. So its function really does matter and it's something that, that not many of us know about. I think that there is such misinformation and a lack of education. So today you can walk away knowing what this nerve is all about and why it's, it's something that you want to tend and befriend, as we say in the naturopathic and functional medicine world. When the vagus nerve is functioning properly, we call it the tend and befriend nerve. And the vagus nerve is uh, really significant in a great many practices. It's something that, that is fundamental to osteopathy and also to chiropractic work. And it's considered to be the 10th cranial nerve. And it's known historically as the wandering nerve because it reaches to nearly every aspect of the body. It starts in the, in the brain in the, and comes out through the 10th cranial nerve and then travels all throughout the body. So it has a part to play in the function of every key organ that there is. 
and it works in in sort of opposition to the sympathetic nervous system which we'll talk about in a minute but the the vagus nerve is part of what's called the parasympathetic nervous system so for those of you who know you realize that there are there are two branches the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system the vagus nerve belongs with the parasympathetic nervous system. That's where we find our capacity to relax. That's where we have our healing potential. The sympathetic nervous system, I like to talk about and remember myself as sympathetic, beginning with S, linked to stress. So if you just remember those two, then you're going to be well on the way to understanding this topic. The sympathetic nervous system is our stress response. So we want to explore what, what that really means. So you can see on this slide, and for those of you who are just listening, there is a slide and you'll get access to, to these slides, I understand, that, that help you to understand what the sympathetic nervous system does and what the parasympathetic nervous system does. As I said, the parasympathetic is related to our relaxation arm and the sympathetic is our stress. And we will dive much more deeply into that today to understand uh, really what that means for us, but the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system are connected. They are what allow our, our organs and our bodies to be in a space of optimal function. Relaxation, tend and befriend or rest and digest is another naturopathic understanding of the vagus nerve function throughout our body. So the vagus nerve has a very big part to play in, in our digestion. So you might have heard of the uh, gut-brain axis, the bi-directional connection between what's going on in our gut and what's going on in our brain. And very much of what we read about online and what is talked about in naturopathy talks about how we can impact our brain through our gut but we can't effectively do that without looking at the brain down impact of what's going on from our nervous system, from our brain to our gut. And we will, as I said, talk more about this throughout our, throughout our session here today. So as I said, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system tend to work in opposition when one is turned on, the other one isn't functioning optimally. And this will become more relevant in a little while when we understand how often our sympathetic nervous system, our stress response is actually switched on without us even knowing it. We've become absolute masters in our day-to-day -day lives, moment to moment, as we're living. We're living in reaction mode, in sympathetic nervous system. And you'll understand that that so much more today as we as we move through the presentation the sympathetic nervous system as I, as i said is the s connection to stress and when we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system we're talking about how our body is responding to external stimulus and we live so much of our lives responding to the external environment so there are many many neurotransmitters and hormones that we're, we're referring to when we talk about the stress response. And one that I'm going to talk about today is cortisol. Uh, but there are many, and this is a very complex conversation to understand, but this will help you uh, to get a very far advanced when it comes to this conversation. But there are others that we need to understand particularly when it comes to uh, how to enhance the positive opposites. Because if we are in sympathetic nervous system dominance too often, there are going to be consequences. So we need to take this conversation very seriously because the stress response in the body, these stress hormones and neurotransmitters are linked to disease processes. Uh, the very foundation of inflammation throughout the body, which is an immune response. And we know that inflammation is central to every chronic disease that there is. So we have to be a bit more aware of, of when and how often these chemicals are being released in our system and the ramifications because it is it is uh, the case that our stress response is can be very subtle and it can be something we get used to, which happens to be, I think, where we're at in our world today. We're just used to it. We can get on in life with stress. We uh, Many of us make a 
a career out of mastering stress and wear it even as a badge. And I'm suggesting that that's not going to lead us where we think it's going to lead us. So let's look at how we can enhance our parasympathetic nervous system, the home of our vagus nerve, the nerve that wanders throughout our body and informs our organs and our cells how to be in an optimal state of functioning. So we do want to have a preference for vagus nerve optimization. And what we know is that just as the sympathetic nervous system releases a set of hormones in a given situation, the parasympathetic nervous system, sorry, hormones and neurotransmitter chemicals, the parasympathetic nervous system does the same thing to counter our sympathetic nervous system, to bring us into a state of relaxation, which is where we find our optimal capacity to function our optimal capacity to feel relaxed and to live a stress-free life, which is what we all want more of. And um, we can get there. We need to consider how to tone the vagus nerve. Vagal tone is a term that you might hear more often. I think that you will, because this is certainly a growing area of scientific research. It's come to uh, the point where now we understand how important this nerve is. The gut was the great discovery of, of recent times in science, and now we're really starting to appreciate that there is another core element of our wellness, and it's found in our brain. It's hiding in plain sight. It's not without, it's within. And that's why I believe we've all got the capacity to be our own champions for health, to be our own healers, to guide our own wellness, uh, rather than looking to anything else outside because they are all limited in their capacity. Um, they may even be detrimental in some way. So let's explore how we can tone the vagus nerve. But the question I have for you now to consider as we move through this presentation is really which system is dominant in you? And I think that if you approach this with an open mind, with a sense of non-judgment, with a sense of curiosity, as we talk about what sympathetic nervous system dominance and parasympathetic nervous system dominance look like, just ask yourself, where do I sit on that scale? And it's not all or nothing here. It's a very, it's a spectrum. It's a sliding scale. And so we can explore where we sit so that we know where to focus our attention because our attention is our greatest asset from a neuroscience perspective. Where we focus our attention is where our energy goes. And we can get focused. We can have less of a kitchen sink approach, as we would say in Australia, which is a scattergun approach. We can get focused and, and take inspired action in the areas that matter. And hopefully you will know a bit more about that today. But first, I want to just share with you what vagus nerve dysfunction looks like. And so if you hear something, just make a note of it so you can come back to it and you can explore these slides and again, this presentation more deeply at a later date. So I'll whiz through these fairly quickly. But vagus nerve dysfunction looks like gastrointestinal symptoms like IBS and IBD, but not limited to those. Inflammatory conditions of all kinds. Obesity and weight issues. So this is where a lot of people can get really stuck and feel like they, they can't shift weight that's on their body. And a lot of it has to do with the sympathetic nervous system, with vagus nerve dysfunction. Depression, anxiety, fatigue, brain fog and fibromyalgia. And these are just, these are exponentially increasing in their incidence in people. So many people suffer from, from a bit of all of these. In fact, you might not even be able to pop yourself in one category, but feel like you, you sometimes show symptoms of, of many of these. Altered perception, which is really interesting when we talk about how the brain works and how our programming is guiding how we view the world. This becomes a very, very interesting conversation and it perhaps is where we can find our path to freedom because our perception is entirely unique. Your set of filters in your mind are unique to you. No other person on the planet has them, which means that the way we perceive this, this world is just our perception and it can be changed. 
The vagus nerve in dysfunction is also associated with behavioural disorders and has a, um, a part to play in terms of a conversation in many, many conditions such as OCD, autism and ADHD. It's also part of the bradycardia picture. It's also um, seen in tinnitus, in sleep dysfunction, in throat swallowing and coughing issues, in delayed gastric emptying and GERD. So a lot of people People who have vagus nerve dysfunction have um, upper upper gut, we call it, when it's to do with the stomach, upper gut issues, and might experience reflux, food sensitivities and allergies, migraines as well. And tinnitus makes a second appearance, as well as B12 deficiency because of um, the, the imbalance that occurs in the gut. And even seizures. On the other hand, we've got vagus nerve tone, so optimal parasympathetic function associated with increased intimacy and bonding so feeling connected brain health and GABA is the the, um, the happy opposite of cortisol we call it GABA is something that we will be hearing more about as science progresses because it's considered to be a very very powerful relaxation neurotransmitter and when the brain is relaxed so is the body and that is where we have optimal function so our stress has far-reaching implications that really it's time we we really explored and understood vagus nerve um, tone is also associated with an antidepressant kind of effect in the body so it can really counter depressive moments and is something that is being explored in continents in the world where they experience seasonal affective disorder where there is that limited light and we know that light is something that that supports neurotransmitters that make us feel good optimal stomach assisted acidity uh, it keeps inflammation in check so where we have inflammation that can just persist at an unseen level and run rampant through our bodies causing all all kinds of progressing disease a proper vagus nerve tone really keeps that in check and helps us to prevent disease it helps to modulate histamine, which is a, a very uh, significant immune reaction. It inhibits the, synth the synthesis of tumor necrosis factor. We want to know about this stuff. If this is helping us to prevent cancer progression in our body, this is important. It helps with food satiety and normalized weight. It helps with blood sugar balance, fertility and orgasm. It helps with healthy sleep, and we all know that sleep is important, but it really is important. From a neuroscience understanding, sleep is in the top three critical necessities, not just optional um, extras, absolute necessity for our brain to function properly. It's in, associated with improved learning and memory. It relieves stress. So let us understand stress a little bit more deeply by having a conversation about cortisol and cortisol is something that you might have heard about it's certainly um, uh, pictured and depicted I should say as as enemy number one when it comes to wellness but but let's be honest about what cortisol does because we need it we can't live without it in fact it is something that has a cyclical pattern in our day. We need to have cortisol to basically get our butts out of bed in the morning. So it's needed to kick us into action. It then dies off and then we should get another surge of it sort of in the afternoon when many of us don't, which is often one of the first clues that we're in a bit of nervous system dysfunction because we tend to flag in the afternoon where we should be having our second cortisol surge to keep us powered through the day so that we dip in cortisol production at night so we can sleep. So cortisol gets us into action. We need it. But what we find is that it is um, being released and uh, where you, our bodies are, are using it far more in ways that are, have negative consequences than, than needs be. So cortisol is one of the major glucocorticoids synthesized in the zona fascicula larger of the adrenal cortex. And its secretion is regulated by the hypothalamic hormone, which is corticotropin-releasing hormone, and the, the pituitary hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, in the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So that's about as technical as we're getting today. But what we know is that 
it's over production in response to perceived threats in our environment which is another one of the cortisol functions apart from its daily requirement in our normal physiological cycles this is where we're getting stuck because we are responding to threats in our environment far more often than we should be for health and wellness from a health and wellness perspective and so this is where we can explore a bit more deeply to understand what are we responding to as a threat is it really a threat and how is this impacting my body because this is where we have our power to to understand Understand what really are threats and how we're responding to them so that we can set our bodies up with resilience to prevent disease for the future So cortisol isn't the enemy Necessarily, but it's ongoing impact on our systems in response to the way our we are perceiving our environment is What is at question? So let's know that we need cortisol it plays a role in our wellness in our capacity to function but it is being over produced and over stimulated because of the way that we're perceiving our environment so cortisol is is important it's needed in a range of uh, functions to maintain balance in our in our blood pressure in our immune system in also in the metabolism of proteins and carbohydrates and in fat tissue as well as as well as having a bit of an anti-inflammatory action only when it is in um, the right kind of balance. So let's look at how the response, uh, our stress response works. How is it that we end up releasing cortisol in our system and, um, and how our stress response should be self-limiting but why it isn't. So really the stress response in the body is usually self-limiting. Once we perceive a threat and our body produces cortisol in response to that threat to to prepare us, to put us on alert that perhaps we need to take action to get ourselves away from that threatening situation, which you can understand is really, really vital. We've got this incredible inbuilt survival mechanism that will respond to threats in our environment, whether it is a perceived emotional threat or whether it really is something that could threaten our lives like that feeling of being followed or that sense that something isn't right or that there's a bus coming down the road and we're about to step out in front of traffic and, and we could get hit so we've got this inbuilt risk assessment unit threat detector that works and when it perceives a threat cortisol is released to keep us um, alert to these situations and ready to act we know it is flight and fight fight flight fight freeze faint um, uh, additions to those to that concept but what we also know is that our inbuilt threat assessment unit that releases cortisol is also responding to what we call paper tigers, perceived threats. But our body doesn't respond any differently, whether it is the threat of a difficult conversation we might have to have or spending time with people that really don't float our boat or knowing that we've got to go and sit an exam or give a presentation or anything else that might be what's considered a paper tiger threat, an emotional threat, rather than something that could physically threaten our lives. So what we know is that our body responds in exactly the same way. And this is really relevant to understand because that cortisol response is happening, uh, whether it is a threat to our lives or whether we are just ruminating on every negative experience we've ever had in our lives. So that's really important to understand that our body is responding in the same way whether it's real or imagined and there's consequences the long-term activation of these stress of our stress response system and that overexposure to that hormone cortisol just that one hormone we're not talking about the impact of all of the others that we identified a few slides back this is significant because it will disrupt how our body is working it will put us into sympathetic nervous system dominance so what that means is that our parasympathetic nervous system our vagus nerve function is 
compromised our sympathetic nervous system is activated and that takes blood flow away from all of those organs away from our digestion away from optimal optimal lung function optimal liver function optimal brain function because the sympathetic nervous system is only designed for us to escape the threat so blood flow and focus is is um is sent to all of those key organs that can help us to get the hell out of that situation that might be a problem that could threaten our bodies and our very survival and it does that whether it is a bus or whether it is an exam whether it's an emotional stress or whether it is a physical stress so that it's really interesting isn't it to think about it in that respect and so we limit our body's capacity to function optimally to head towards health if we are hijacked by our nervous system and the hormone cortisol too often which is what is happening and so we find that these conditions anxiety immune dysfunction digestive problems headaches heart disease sleep problems weight gain memory and concentration impairment as well as that entire slide and list of health issues are what we predispose ourselves to when the stress response system is activated as it is far more often than we like to admit so remember to be embracing the idea of curiosity and non-judgment when we consider where we sit in respect of this conversation let's just have a look at a, a study that was conducted in the early 1980s by psychologist janice janet um, Kaikol Glaser, PhD, and immunologist Ronald Glaser, PhD. And they did this study at the Ohio State University College of Medicine, where they observed that the very um, fact of sitting an exam was enough to diminish immune function through activating the sympathetic nervous system so significantly that they had fewer natural killer cells which are what what are needed to fight tumors and viral infections in the body they were under such significant stress through sitting exams that they diminished immune function for a very significant period of time so that's something to to really understand the gravity of what stress can do to our systems in terms of really diminishing our ability to cope our immune system is our is on alert 24 hours a day to keep us well and if we compromise its ability to do that you can understand how sickness over time can find its way to thrive in our bodies and as the father of modern pathology dr verkow said that a, a bug a pathogen a virus a bacteria can only thrive in an environment that allows it to do so because the human body is built for resilience we are programmed for wellness and so we need to understand how this conversation about stress um, and sympathetic nervous system dominance and optimizing the vagus nerve becomes really critical as a very very core pillar of our wellness potential and of our pen potential to fight disease there are many studies and i and i love to to research but i will cap it at a few for today's conversation but you can of course do your own and i would suggest that you do because there is a lot of data out there that's supporting this understanding of stress impacting our wellness potential more than anything else it is the thing that will derail us and we can't as i i often say we can't supplement and nutrition our way to wellness they are further downstream um, actions i'm all about in my uh, practice getting to the root cause because i think any other kind of action is limited in its potential so why not go straight to the core well i can tell you that stress uh, and our the our nervous system function is a core area of of uh, needing our attention and when we harness our potential to impact this profoundly beneficially we really free ourselves from this prevailing model of disease but this particular study really really um, highlights how our stress impacts our wellness but more specifically what I want to focus on now is how our mind how our 
thoughts, our mindset really has the capacity to uh, drive wellness to our nervous system, whether that is sympathetic nervous system dominance or whether that is through optimal parasympathetic nervous system uh, impact, thus optimizing vagus nerve function. So we need to find a way to optimize that. And, and from my clinical practice, I see that the most effective way to achieve optimal vagus nerve function, relaxation through the brain and thus through the nerve to every cell in our body is to explore our thinking, is to explore our mindset as the key driver of stress. And I think everyone can benefit from this, regardless of what we're experiencing, whether we see ourselves as asymptomatic, so whether we see ourselves as vitally healthy, I think this is one of the key conversations we can have to maintain that. And for anyone who is experiencing any kinds of symptoms, let's look at our thinking. So science has shown that this is really critical. And how can we harness this for ourselves and bring back our power to to drive our wellness or to drive our own disease. So this is really the, the work of um, um, Lynn McTaggart, Bruce Lipton, and so many others who are looking at the, um, the physics of the metaphysics, the neuroscience of wellness. And I really like Bruce Lipton's work the bio, in his biology of belief. And he often talks about how 70% or more of our thinking, according to psychology research, is, is uh, really limiting, is unhelpful, and is not supporting optimal vagus nerve function. So we want to be really aware of that. So let's get this a little bit more personal to understand how we can explore how we get stressed and and why we want to know more about this. So you might feel that, that stress is something that is a natural response to external events, that when we experience something in our environment or an interaction with people or the way that we view the world or how we feel when we watch the news, that it is, it is because of those events that we can feel stress and that that's justified. And that's perfectly normal to think that. That's how we've been trained to, to look at life. But, but it's not entirely the case. The reality is that every situation that we find ourselves in is actually neutral. It isn't good or bad. It isn't right or wrong. It is the meaning that we apply to anything that is the stress response potentially. If we have a lens or a perception, a set of filters in our mind that tell us that an event is a stressful kind of event, that there is something negative about it, then that is how we, how we see it. But the next person might not see it like that at all. And I want to explain this a little bit more deeply because we might see that certain circumstances are responsible for feeling, for, for how we feel. So we might be in a slow moving line in a supermarket and that might be really frustrating. So let's understand that stress isn't just the big things. It isn't just the moving house, the getting divorced, the deaths in the families, the, um, what's one of the other ones that's in the top five, the speaking in public, um, birth, is actually another major stress in women's lives. So we've got these stresses and they're the big ones that are obvious, but it's the little things that I think are more important to understand. It's the little things like getting frustrated in the day, getting irritated, getting upset because our partners haven't spoken to us nicely, getting frustrated because the kids are taking too long to get, to get ready, feeling overwhelmed because we've got so many assignments due and exams coming up, uh, feeling like our friends just aren't there for us when they should be, feeling uh, alone and um, unable to find the connection that we really want in our lives. Those sorts of things are what we need to have on our radar as as part of this conversation about stress, because that's what uh, is meaningful to every one of us in our everyday lives. And that is what is triggering these kinds of responses where the hormone cortisol, for example, is released. 
far more often than is needed and it is doing a number it is having an impact on our immune systems and that's just so significant to understand so let's just go back to this one example of being in a supermarket in a slow moving line when you've got all of these stresses going on but what if you picked up a magazine and discovered that there's an article that really intrigues you and you're really interested in reading about now all of a sudden that stress can turn into possibly a pleasurable experience but the event didn't go away the only thing that changed is well there was a distraction but it was your mindset you found something else to focus on and when we can understand a little bit more about how our brain functions we can harness its potential to think in a different way so I want to talk to you about neuroplasticity because this is so fascinating this is an area of neuroscience that is looking at how our brains are wired so we have our program our set of filters that make up the way that we perceive our world but neuroscience tells us that we can change our neural wiring through a range of practices, some of which I'll talk about today, to perceive life in a different way. So just because we see things in a certain way doesn't mean we can't train ourselves to see things differently. Doesn't mean we can't pose questions to ourselves to look at, at our experiences in a different way because the way that we do look at them, as I said, is very unique to us and is very limited we can in any given situation find myriad ways of looking at a situation and we can harness the science of neuroplasticity to install in our brains new wiring new ways of looking at our experience and interestingly this is very connected to our sympathetic nervous system as well so we can only impact our brains if we aren't stressed so we have to find a way to impact how our nervous system is functioning, to optimize our parasympathetic and our vagus nerve function in order to install new neural programs. And we can, neuroplasticity tells us that we can do this at any stage of life. It is certainly um, very, very functioning and dynamic. Uh, when we're young, we are just sponges. When we're young, we're, we're creating our belief systems, our neural pathways, and we're soaking up life in a, in a bigger, more profound way than we do necessarily when we're older. But that doesn't mean it needs to stop because our brain can reshape itself from the moment we are born to the moment that we pop off the perch at the other end of the spectrum. And so we've got this incredible capacity always to perceive our lives in different ways through the way that we can impact our mind and neuroplasticity is part of that conversation. So the way to harness this is to understand that neuroplasticity is built on firing um, certain thoughts in a persistent, frequent fashion. In neuroscience, we call this neurons that fire together, wire together. So we want to fire neurons that enhance our well-being. And until we do that, stress really can be ripping us off because we don't understand how our mind is working. And I want to just share with you a, a little case study from my clinic that might help you to understand this conversation in a, in a different way. I work with um, chronic health issues. I've specialised in uh, chronic health issues in children specifically. So I work with a lot of families, usually mums more than anything. And you can understand and appreciate that a child with a chronic health issue, whether that is a uh, cancer, an autoimmune disease, whether that is epilepsy, whether that's a chronic kind of infection, or just a chronic health issue, a persistent health issue that might be medita medicated. It's, it's stressful, no doubt about it. And so this particular family that I worked with resolved the health issue that uh, had been part of their lives for six years for their child and it had caused a lot of stress or seemingly caused a lot of stress. 
and this family was really banking on feeling very, very differently on the other side of healing their son from this health issue. And once he was healed, once he was off medication, once he was experiencing life very differently, uh, they thought it would make them feel better, that it would take away the stress in their lives, that they would re revert to their memories of happiness, their memories of relaxation. But what actually happened was that they healed their son and he was a happy, healthy, normal eight-year-old once again. But the mum came to me one day and said, Sal, I felt great for about half a day and then realised that that same feelings, those same feelings were still there. I was still stressed. So I now understand what you mean when I say we, we need to explore our mindset. And so when she did that, that is when she was able to find her peace of mind, her capacity to tackle other challenges in life and still feel good about herself. But to deal with stress was the, the critical piece of that puzzle. It wasn't healing the disease, which I think is so, so interesting for many, many people to deeply understand and so pivotal in the work that I do. I want to share with you the, the brain model from Dr. Sarah Mackay, who's a neuroscientist who hails from New Zealand, but is um, living in Australia. She was one of the mentors that I learned from in the area of neuroscience. She has an academy called the Neuroscience Academy. And she talks about the top down, bottom up, outside in approach to the brain. And so this conversation today is really largely focused on the top down model of our brain and our brain health, which drives our, our nervous system function, which drives our wellness through our thoughts. But you've got this now on your slides and I want you to, to consider this potentially as you move forward to look at what are, the, what are the other aspects that impact our brain? Because if our nervous system is, is driving wellness throughout our, our every cell in our body, through our organs, we need to know all of the things that can be impacting how our brain is functioning. It's such a vital conversation. So really, I want to spend the rest of our conversation now about how to fix it. How can we install a program of optimal wellness through our brain, through our nervous system to optimise our vagus nerve, to achieve wellness, to live our lives with the level of relaxation, with peace of mind, with a feeling of everything's okay, everything's okay, no matter what, with an understanding that we are in charge of how our brain is working. Because the truth is we are in charge of our thinking, our behaviour, our reactions and our actions. It might not feel like that. And that is perfectly normal, as I was saying before, because we're not taught to understand how our brain actually works but we are reacting to life in a way that is diminishing our potential for relaxation uh, simply because we are so deeply connected with the way that we are thinking rather than understanding that we are actually more, more aligned with, with um, other models of wellness and healing, traditional models as we see in Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, that there are two minds. There's actually the thinking mind, which we're very attached to. What we think we are experiencing is what feels incredibly real for us. But we are, in fact, not that mind. We are our observing mind. We have our thoughts, but we aren't our thoughts. We have our feelings, but we aren't our feelings. We have emotions, but we aren't our emotions. We can actually disassociate from those and become the observer to see what it is we are thinking and feeling and observing in our experience. And we just can simply practice that. With, with the attitude of curiosity and non-judgment, we can begin to do this more and more throughout our day to see where we are hijacked by that program of just thinking, of perceiving life that is built on our survival filters. And so it just takes practice throughout our day to begin to observe, begin to observe what we're thinking in our moments of stress when we see that an exam is coming up and we start to freak out about it, when we, we, we know that we've got lots of work that needs to get done and somehow there's still only 24 hours in a day, when we know that we need to spend time focused on feeling good and doing our meditation and possibly doing yoga and possibly eating well. 
but we're just too busy to do that. We can become far more responsible, which is really, really critical. It's uh, taking responsibility for ourselves is considered to be the number one success principle uh, it, through life coaching, through um, transpersonal counselling and gestalt therapy as well, which is so, so important to understand. We can take responsibility and the more we do that, the more we can see that we actually hold the power in our lives to live with freedom, to find our bliss, as Joseph Campbell said. But the, the practice that I really want you to walk away with uh, understanding is what's called the crap analysis and I learned this from Mark Waldman who's a neuroscience researcher and it's such an interesting practice because it it really is a sneaky way of freeing our mind from stress which can produce a cortisol reaction from the body which is something that we know is going to lead us where we don't want to go down the inflammation pathway to towards dis-ease because of that sympathetic nervous system dominance that we can be living in when we are stressed throughout the day. And the crap analysis is simply a way of taking out of our mind and putting down on paper, which literally takes fuel from our brain that it would otherwise just play with and then um, weigh up against our survival program to see what the risk is there, what's going to be potentially a harm that could come from this. And remember that the body is responding to these imagined experiences that trigger emotions as much as they trigger our instinct for survival. The same things are happening. But when we take this out of our brain, our conflicts, our resistances, our anxieties, our problems, so CRAP is the acronym that expands into these concepts, when we take everything that's bothering us basically out of our brain and put it onto paper, we've done something really powerful. We have taken fuel away from our brain and given us an opportunity to replace those thoughts with other thoughts, with ones that can be more empowering. So if we are facing exams or have a lot of work pressure, we can take the opportunity to put it into perspective, to say, well, it's just one exam and the truth is I've I've really actually studied a lot for this so I'm prepared probably more than I think and I'll be okay. We can now replace, we now have the power by replacing that thinking that we've observed as being harmful, we've written it down on paper, we can now really uh, harness our, our wellness potential by expanding on, on the crap analysis. And Mark Waldman says, do this often, do this frequently. Paula, can I just ask you, do I have a bit more time to, to expand on these or have you got a lot of questions? Oh, you're, you're good to continue, Sally. Okay, I will, because this is, this is what we want to spend time on. I agree. So the crap, yeah, the crap analysis is, um, as Mark Waldman says, something that we can do throughout the day. It's not something you'll do once because we are facing, we're facing events that trigger our emotions, negative emotions, many, many times in the day. So he suggests that we, we do this practice, writing down what bothers us onto paper, taking it out of our brain. And when it is left in our brain, it is simply fuel for that automatic program to assess the threat and likely cause a cortisol release in response because we are now prepared and ready and on alert for a paper tiger, not a real threat. So we take it out of our brain, we put it down on paper. If you do this every single day, that in itself is something that I've seen in my practice through working in this in the realm of mindset, through life coaching, through transpersonal counselling, as one of the most powerful activities that we can do for ourselves to, to diminish the impact that stress can have. So do the crap analysis, and it's so, so simple. You don't need to go and see a therapist to do this. You just need, as far as I'm concerned, a piece of paper and a cuppa which for everyone who isn't English or Australian, that's a cup of tea uh, or a glass of water or a glass of kombucha or whatever it is that, that you like to drink and sit down and write down all your problems. And that is performing a great service to your brain and your nervous system. 
so that you can enhance how your brain and nervous system are functioning and we know how important that are they are another practice that you may have have heard about and you certainly will hear more about because it is now recognized as a powerful practice from a science perspective to calm the amygdala now we haven't talked about the amygdala but the amygdala is uh, an area of our brain, part of our brain in our um, midbrain that is our fear response center. So this is one of the ways that we are filtering everything that we experience in our environment. And our amygdala is um, our emotions filter. So it's really looking for threats and it's our fear center. So it's responding to, to everything that we've got a filter for um, that is negative, that is a stress of some kind, a frustration, an irritation, a criticism, a personal criticism, a personal judgment, anything that we might engage in in terms of perception that leads us to feel less than great. And this all happens through our amygdala. So when we can find ways to speak directly through to our amygdala and calm it, which tapping does. Now, because what we, we don't have a camera on, I can't show you what that looks like. But you can explore this and tapping is a really, really powerful tool that directly speaks to the amygdala. It is a practice that harnesses two really powerful psychological principles. One of exposing ourselves and exposing what we're feeling in terms of an emotion. So if we, we can acknowledge that in any given moment we're feeling angry, frustrated, irritated, hurt, grieving, upset, jealous criticized, um, not enough, unworthy. When we can simply acknowledge that about ourselves, we do diminish our stress. When we can acknowledge that we're feeling something, and the second part to the EFT tapping equation that makes it so incredibly powerful is that we say, even though I feel frustrated, angry, upset, irate, furious, there's a very, very big list of negative emotions, that we could possibly experience. When we acknowledge that we're feeling something and then we say, I accept myself anyway, that is where we have incredible power. That is so exciting to be able to, to be in that space. And there is, um, out of UCLA, there was a really, really incredible tool that I also use that I call a stress busting tool, which is name it to tame it. That is just that, naming the emotion and taking a deep breath. This is something that, that enhances how our nervous system works. So in terms of the long-term wellness for our, our brain and nervous system function, it really is about understanding that our brain has to align and our nervous system have to align with the vision that we have for our wellness. I don't meet people who don't want to feel good, who don't want to have great health. Well, it can't happen if our brain is programmed for dis-ease, by responding to our environment in a stressful way when there really isn't any stress, when we really isn't, when there really isn't a threat to our survival, when it is a perceived threat or a paper tiger as we call it. So to explore our thoughts, to take this more deeply and explore our belief systems, to look at what's going on in that program that is our program for perceiving our life's experience, to keep what's working and to change what isn't. And if psychology research has shown that 70% or more of, of that program is potentially unhelpful and harmful, we really want to do this work because this is, this is the, the critical uh, piece of the puzzle. This is the trump card um, because we simply can't nutrition and supplement our way to wellness. So we can move towards creating our own daily self-care, a ritual for maintaining optimal function through our brain and our nervous system, thus optimising the vagus nerve. So engaging in social activity, in, in great nutrition, in optimising our sleep, in doing exercise, in priming our brain for wellness and engaging in relaxation activity because this is what will drive wellness through our nervous system. And if you have a healthy nervous system function, you are going to have health and the ability to maintain health long-term, the ability to heal, the ability to keep disease at bay for life.
driven through your brain and nervous system and that is where the focus really needs to be because even nutrition even the most expensive shiny new supplements on the face of the planet aren't powerful enough to override a brain and mind and nervous system that is set to stress so this becomes a really critical conversation so i hope that that you understand this conversation a little bit more and are perhaps interested to explore it more deeply and understand now where you sit on the sliding scale of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system function in the body so paula how can i serve you now in terms of answering any questions well, thank you very much, first of all, for this delightful presentation. It's been really um, mind-opening, so thank you for that. It's a pleasure, absolutely. So yes, um, there's a few questions here. And, you know, first I just want to um, say I, re I really appreciate the, um, the term tend and befriend. It's it, it's something that I've learned and apply in my um, mindfulness practice, and so it's like attend and befriend is <laughs> pay attention, yes. give, give our attention in a very different way. I think yes. that um, so much of us, it, it's just ingrained in us at, at this point in our evolution, um, our cultural practices, that we have a tendency to to be very reactive. Yes. as opposed to so we react versus respond we react yes. to these external stimuli we react to very quickly to things people say and that propels the stress that we're feeling and projects it oftentimes onto other people too and and, and i think a critical piece here is self-compassion it's like if yes. we can find the compassion within ourselves to be compassionate towards others and learn to be compassionate towards ourselves. And, and, and sometimes that's as much as, you know, when you when we can identify a feeling that's real, it's real, but it does not define us. And as, as gently even to put our hand on our heart and say, oh, sweetie, you know, I, <laughs> that's, it's going to be okay. It shifts mm -hmm. so much. Um, you know, I just, compassion is huge here and part of, um, a part of fixing the mind from, from my perspective. I agree. I think it's really, I think I'm so glad you've made that point. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think very much, you know, you framed this so well. There's, you know, I encourage everybody to really explore this in more depth. The vagus nerve, uh, the science that's coming out behind it, the influence that it has on every single organ of our body. Um, is is essential and to be able to apply the, the crap analysis I'm, I, I'm really glad that you brought this up because one of the things I'm I, I'm wondering and one of the questions is do you think that um, does it have to be writing everything down do you think that somebody could as effectively dictate their their thoughts because writing can be stressful for some people and that stream of consciousness just lets it lets it go what, what do you think I, I love that question. I think that I'm so glad that, that that's been asked, actually, because the the science does show that writing it is uh, incredibly powerful in its action. So it's not that dictating it might not be impactful. It's simply that writing it is most impactful, more impactful, in fact. Mm -hmm. So it can be um, just, I think, however it works and of course we are all unique there is never going to be one right way for all of us so i think however we acknowledge our problems because when we do that we diminish their power so mark waldman's work was about writing and he has shown that it does diminish the energetic connection that we retain with whatever whatever that thought was whatever crap it was becomes less significant when it's on paper because we have the capacity to connect to a different part of our brain that is limited when we're in sympathetic nervous system dominance. So our executive brain is actually hijacked if we are in a cortisol release phase of our day. And so we don't have the capacity to come up with creative solutions. But when we become, when we're writing or even possibly when we're dictating information, we become present. And so we have the capacity to uh, 
um, harness the power of our left free prefrontal cortex, which is our genius zone, our executive brain, our creative and calm place. So I would say it's still beneficial, but writing has shown to be most effective. Yes. Just the, the thought was, um, the follow to that, I think the thought is that, you know, working with clients, they'll say, you want me to do what? <laughs> I'm so stressed. Can't you tell how stressed I am? I've been telling you this whole time. I don't have time. <laughs> Yeah. Now you want me to write? I have so much to write. I could be there for days. I could write so much. <laughs> I can't yes. do this. <laughs> so. Yes. So yes. how would and you respond to that? Well, I think we have to meet people where they're at. So if there is someone that we're, we're dealing with um, that is in that space, I think the first thing to do would be to help them to find calm in another way. Perhaps the, the, even the technique, Paula, that you suggested, close your eyes and put your hand on your heart. Let's just bring it in and, and and remind ourselves that we are okay right now. We're okay. We could be even more okay in a few minutes. I might even, I could even imagine that in a in a couple of days with some more tools under my belt, I could be even more okay and help to talk them into a more a less stress uh, stress stress response, for want of a better way of describing it, because we can bring our our cortisol levels down through a range of techniques. Crap analysis is just one. And I can tell you there are literally hundreds of them. Some people will tell you that that the crap analysis is the best thing since sliced bread. Others will tell you that they're too stressed to do it. So what can we do in those sorts of situations? We can tap, we can help people to just breathe. Interestingly, when it comes to uh, calming our system, and I'll just let you know, Paula, that I'm okay for time. I've got a, I've got a bit more time up my sleeve. Um, it is the out breath, not the in breath. So often we hear people say, take a deep breath, take a deep breath in, and people will, will, and it doesn't help. In fact, it can really exacerbate those feelings of stress. It is the out breath, really ex expelling as much air out of our lungs as we can. That is what triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. So the in breath triggers sympathetic. The out breath triggers parasympathetic, which is where our vagus nerve is at home. And so we can help them to breathe. <sighs> and that will diminish the heightened stress response mm -hmm. to then say, okay, now tell me what you're experiencing right now. Let's use name it to tame it or tapping to bring it down even more. Mm -hmm. And then we can apply a technique like this. So it really is just a tool that for any practitioner is part of a tool belt that is incredibly effective in the right circumstances. Right. Thank you so much for bringing in breath work in this. I think it's it, it's critical in um, activating the parasympathetic, and I I I, I so appreciate the the um, full um, expelling of air to activate the parasympathetic. And yes, and, and, you know I I I grew up in a in a large family where you know, before we ate, we sat down as a family and, you know, we said grace. We said our our gratitude for what we were about to receive. And I think that was a real shifting. You know, it shifted us from the busyness and everything we were doing to the day and bringing us present to what yes. was. And, and and so it was prayer, it's breathing, it's focus, it's, it's the gift of our attention to what's right there for us that can, yes. you know, help us begin to shift and, 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 and shift us away from the, the plethora of paper dragons that, <laughs> that yeah. change us everywhere, right? Yes, absolutely. I think that I love, um, actually, it's something I talk about a lot with working with families is create a dinner time routine because how we show up at the dinner table anytime we eat yes. has a lot to do with what goes on in our bodies. If we are trying to eat our food stressed, it doesn't make it doesn't have it doesn't end well let me tell you so what we want to do is to is to approach every meal time by doing something like that maybe just breathe beforehand and then be grateful that you know we do have the luxury of a meal in front of us which for many people around the world is a luxury and so we can put ourselves in a very different nervous system set point before we eat which is going to have massive benefits for every cell in our body Lovely, thank you. So th this is an interesting question. Um, 
If acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter of the vagus nerve, is there a test to check blood levels of acetylcholine? There are tests to check. At the moment, you know, our pathology system isn't always what we think it is. It's only as good as the minds that come up with the test. And there, I'd love to say that there's just one test that we can do for, for all of this, for all of these kinds of um, neurotransmitters. But yes, there are there are tests that we can do. Some of them are individual tests. Some of them are byproducts. So we would be looking at organic acids testing that is done through um, urine samples. Um, I tend to use blood, urine, saliva for many, many hormones. Um, but yes, we can get testing done. It's, it's a bit tricky around the world because there are some labs that do them and some that don't. So we can have testing done for, for, for all of those uh, neurotransmitters. But it's not one test, unfortunately, at this stage. <laughs> that will change. It changes so fast. There's new tests that, that I read about and get sent information from my labs that I use about all the time. So it's, it's I think, growing very, very fast in its capacity. So, you know, bookmark that page because it's likely that we will be able to have them all tested. The only, the only challenge is that um, to get a, a proper snapshot of cortisol, for example, we need to do um, a, a saliva test is usually what we consider to be the most accurate at various points in the day. Yes. And so multiple multiple tests. Um, so it's, it's about picking the right, getting the right time really when it comes to testing because they're, they're just one small piece of a puzzle. I think that they, sometimes they're really overrated. In fact, pathology can be useless, yes. but it can be re really useful at times. Yes, it can, it can provide information and information can be useful. It can be, it's like overwhelming yes. for some yeah. people too, but we, we just finished a six part um, lab testing series and covered certainly the, HPA acts, stress access. Um, yeah, yeah, and, great. Okay. And, and, yeah, so, um, and there's a two-hour class coming up in July. With our students are now um, submitting their, getting their test kits and doing the, the the test and getting in, and those will all be reviewed in a class coming up July 11th. So, fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Um, back to Vegas stimulator. Um, yes. This question yes. is: a Vegas stimulator increases voltage upon seizure onset. What chemical reactions promote proper signal strength within the vagus nerve? Is it primarily acetylcholine deficiency? With reference to, that's a, that's a pretty tricky question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we want to look at it in terms of, um, so this question is really specific to seizure activity. Seems so, yes. Like what, what chemical re, um, reactions promote proper signal strength within the vagus nerve? Well, I think we're going to be talking more about the, um, the GABA, really. We want to, we want to be looking at the, the dopaminergic um, neurotransmitters mm -hmm. to, which has a backstory about our genetics as well. So we want to know, um, so if we just keep it really, really focused, my brain's yeah. going to, what's behind that? So <laughs> there's always something behind that. So we want to always, uh, that's just the question I've trained myself to ask. So yes, yeah, so we'll be looking at um, acetylcholine as, um, it's not necessarily a, a deficiency because there's too much, there's just too many factors to consider. But we would be looking at at that in terms of the seizure, um, diminishing the the seizure activity, and also in the same in uh, depressive patients as well. So the the stimulation of the vagus nerve is used in both those situations. But yes, it is the ACTH that that is considered to be the the uh, neurotransmitter that is the the target. Eric goes. The person asking the question here goes on to explain that they have an issue with choline genes um, being somewhat dysfunctional, and they have to take yes. 
lecithin and choline supplements and yes you know, and foods like yeah. eggs etc so i think you know, yeah. that, that kind of helps put this whole thing together but thank yes. you for that is well responded yeah. to yeah i think it's really important to to always be asking what's behind that because there's always a genetic aspect potentially as well and so we've got to have a very broad perspective it's never going to be that there is a supplement that we can take we can harness harness aspects of nutrition and supplementation and other kinds of therapy and when we do that and find our unique healing prescription as much as we need to find our unique food prescription that's where we can take back our power okay the last point here, and then I have some closing comments, Sally, but uh, yes. one of our graduates uh, on your first slide and um, uh, with for the, um, you, you were listing the hormones and the hormones, you have CHR, and she said, does she mean CRH for corticotropin releasing hormone? <laughs> she probably does. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just going back and I would say yes, if, if I've made a mistake, then yes, I'm just going back to it. It's not a mistake. Oh, no, wrong way. Wrong way. Yeah. There you go. Your slide six is for you. Yeah, got it. <laughs> I loved it. It's like yes, you know, Hawthorne University grads rock. I love it when they pick up on yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would love to say that I never make mistakes, but that would be a mistake. <laughs> Oh, it's just a little inversion of letters. We can, we're not going to put, the, put know, such a label I might, on it. I might be onto something. Watch this space. <laughs> okay. Um, I have some closing comments, everybody. I just want to remind you that this webinar was recorded and it'll be available on our website under archived webinars in just a few days. And our next webinar coming up to, is a good follow for this. We have um, naturopath Tom Ballard, who I met at the recent conference, the National Association of Nutrition Professionals Conference. And he's going to talk to us more about genomic testing and results and, of course, nutritional strategies. So I'm excited to bring you this important information. Tom Ballard's a great presenter, and the info like this with Sally Gray can be life-changing. And a reminder about our next All About Alumni presentation is tomorrow, Wednesday, June 6th at noon Pacific time with Tanya Harris. She'll be presenting about her post MSHN graduate activities, and the All About Alumni are always presented on the first Wednesday of each month. There's a little survey for you to fill out after the webinar ends. I'll, you know, it really helps us to have your feedback. Any comments or thoughts that you have about this presentation or upcoming ones, I appreciate you taking the time, and I want you to know that I do too to follow up on this. And um, I think that's it. You know, this is just a reminder that these webinars are are offered freely and your attendance really matters. It means so much to us, it's why we do it. And if you can support our mission in any way, please consider a donation to help us continue. It's simple on our website, there's a red button somewhere, just click it. And if you know we've inspired you to learn more through this presentation about health and nutrition, um, please visit our website. There's a plethora of courses and programs and things for you to explore. And, you know, I think that's it. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much, Sally. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I hope that if um, at least one person walks away with, with wanting to explore the vagus nerve and, and stress and how the brain functions and optimizing their nervous system, then I feel like uh, this has been all worthwhile. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to wish everybody the best of health. I look forward to learning more together in our Hawthorne University webinar series and our All About Alumni series. And, and until then, I'm going to continue practice breathing and healing my vagus nerve because what we practice grows stronger. So I'm going to hope that you'll join me in this too. Thanks, everybody.